I love that's what you were thinking about at 13. I was at Sabaros. <laughs> <laughs> I did love Sabaros though. Sabaros oh, is the best, right? Their garlic bread. <laughs> Thank you. So good. Welcome to Couch Surfing, the show where amazing guests look back at their big roles, their little roles, and everything in between. I'm here with Jennifer Morrison. Jennifer, let's see what's on, shall All right. we? Sounds good. All right. Well, who's that little ballerina? That is 13-year-old me. I um, years later realized I had a really strong Chicago accent in this movie, really? which made no sense because no one else that I was related to had that accent. But Richard Gere is your dad in I know, this film. I know. Richard Gere. What a man. And Sharon Stone was your mom? Yeah. Okay, so two of the sexiest people in <laughs> film in the 90s are your parents. I think it was lucky that I was so young because I wasn't intimidated because I like their movies were all R-rated. Well, so uh, I had no point of reference for how famous Richard Gere was or how famous Sharon Stone was at the time. So I was definitely just like hanging out. Like it was totally normal <laughs> to <laughs> chill with Richard Gere and Sharon Stone when I was 13. I remember being in that scene and having so much fun because Richard was so generous. And then um, Mark Rydell directed, actually, who I felt like was like my first real acting teacher because I was a very emotive kid, but I was big. And he was always like, if you think it, you can see it. And I was like, oh, okay. So I kind of was learning to reel it in instead of being so big all the time. So I remember those conversations, but I also remember feeling like, I have no idea what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. I love this, but I don't know what I'm doing. Right. All right, next clip. You ready? I'm ready. <laughs> Oh boy, Dawson's Creek. <laughs> Look at that nice boat that I loaned Pacey. Wasn't that nice of me? You were a baller. <laughs> <laughs> I was in law school, too busy to hang out with Pacey because I was just, you know, keeping him on the side for my fun on the yacht whenever I felt like it, I guess. Okay, so what was it like to join one of the biggest shows on television? I was so excited because I mean, I was a fan of the show and I loved it and it was really cool to be a part of something I was a fan of. So you played Pacey's first love interest after he broke up with Joey, correct? Oh, was I first after her? I believe so. I wonder so. it didn't work out. No. Jeez. <laughs> Did you get hate mail? Because you know. This was pre-social media, so um, I was in the safety zone at that time, thank God. <laughs> nope. I might not be alive to tell you about it otherwise. <laughs> Are you having fun? Uh, so much fun, oh, this is so crazy. But you still look nervous, relax. Oh yeah, no, I, I, I get nervous <laughs> to watch myself. I'm like spritzing over here. <laughs> it's okay. Cancer, Parkinson's, or any other degenerative condition. But there's this boy at school. Is it weird that I don't remember shooting that scene? No, it's not. I think I did like a, over 130 episodes of the show. Whoa. Um, and because everything takes place in all the same rooms, right. things would start to blend together in really weird ways. Yeah, um, I get that. And I would, to this day, I'll run into people who are like, I was the patient who had such and such. And I would have spent the whole episode with that patient. I'd be like, I, uh, <laughs> I don't even remember. Glad and to see you're alive. <laughs> I know, and I did so much research. I looked up every disease I talked about. I like always was really devoted to really knowing what I was talking about. But there was just something about, I guess, the hours and how exhausted we were and how similar the environments were over and over again. It's hard to keep it all separate in my mind. And you were on that show for six seasons, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And medical jargon, you really have to master it and deliver it in a convincing way. How do yeah. you go about doing that? It definitely requires more effort than memorizing normal stuff. Right. You know, obviously memorizing is a muscle, but when you have all those medical words and you have the pressure of the time crunch and you know, we do these scenes where Hugh would have these huge monologues mm -hmm. and of course that needed to be the priority. It's like he's got to get through these huge giant monologues and sometimes you'd have one line but the pressure of that one line at the end of the monologue, you don't want to screw up the whole scene and you'd be like sitting there being like, it's gonna be okay, it's gonna be okay, it's gonna be okay. I'm listening, I'm listening, I'm listening. I'm oh, I gotta say this medical thing, you know? Up next, shall we? <laughs> I'm gonna beam us up out of here. Oh, I know what's coming. <laughs> oh, you do? There we go. Oh. Okay, so now you're officially one of the most famous mothers in cinema history. So crazy, right? Mm -hmm. This was pretty nuts to get this role. So I was so excited to be a part of this franchise and work with JJ and yeah, it was really, very cool. So you're in a way, William Shatner's mom. Yeah, we've talked about that. Really? <laughs> yeah. So I, I do, you know, I'll go to the fan conventions, mm -hmm. uh, especially because of Once Upon a Time and Star Trek and stuff. Right. And he'll be there because of Star Trek. And so, and he, he being William Shatner. He being William Shatner. Yes. And he really likes Once Upon a Time. And so we've had conversations uh. about 
he's very active on Twitter, like yes. with other shows and things like that. So we've had some exchanges about him being my son and, and me being proud of him and him thinking I was a good mom. And it's really <laughs> nice. He's, he's a very thoughtful child. I, I also that. am Chris Pine's mom, which I'm totally fine with that as well. I, I'm, I'm good with both situations. <laughs> You've got some good kids. You got some good kids. Yes. You're a good mom. Thanks. Happy Mother's Day. <laughs> Thank you. Up next, ready? Yeah, I'm ready. All right. Bring it on. <laughs> oh yes. How I met your mother. Beautiful building, right? Look, I really had to fight for this job. Vincent. You did? I did, because no one believed I could be funny. Confused. They were like, she's on a medical show. She can't possibly be funny. And so I had made a tape where it was the scene where I'm throwing the eggs, so I was throwing ping pong balls mm -hmm. out of an egg thing. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, and which was a mess, because I had to put sheets everywhere in the apartment, because otherwise the ping pong balls bounced everywhere right. when I threw them. It, it's these things that no one thinks about when you're you know, doing these audition tapes. And then I had to fly to LA to go in to audition for them, but the room they were supposed to have me in was unavailable. And I forgot that I had left my car parked at my boyfriend's house at the time. So I landed at the airport, got to my house, realized I didn't have a car. Oh, no. So I got in the car with my contractor in this giant, like, big wheel, like, floor wheel, <laughs> bright orange vehicle that had no roof. So I literally look like I'm in The Fast and the Furious or something with my contractor who's working at my house driving me to Universal. And I'm barely getting there in time. My hair is super windblown. I've got my ping pong balls in an egg cart in my backpack, and I've got a megaphone and I get there like all windblown and I jump out of my big four-wheeler and they're like we can't find a room for this we're just gonna do it in the trailer so then I was like in a teeny tiny tiny trailer oh, no. screaming at them with a megaphone and throwing ping-pong balls at everybody and they're like it's fine it's fine you got the job, <laughs> got the job. <laughs> I think I just harassed them into it <laughs> like, I just loved being on that set that was the happiest I've ever been on a set it was a fun group of people Pam Fryman who directs all the episodes is incredible and so inspirational yeah. and it's just fun to go and make people laugh every day. I like you. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> oh, Once Upon a Time. Mm -hmm. You were on this show for six seasons as well. Yeah. Was it hard to leave? Um, you know, it was bittersweet. Mm -hmm. I think um, six years is a really long time. That's a long run. Yeah. Especially and in television, network television. Yeah, yeah. The hours are really grueling and I was away from home. I think that was the hardest thing was just to be in the middle of uh, Vancouver and away from my friends and my family. And um, it, that's six years is, and it's nine and a half months, almost 10 months out of the year that you're away once you add it all up. Goodness. So I just felt like I had been pulled away from my life for so long. So I loved the character and I loved the show and I loved the fans. They're so passionate and so devoted and amazing. So but my heart kind of broke on that side of it. But for me as a person, I felt like I had to do what was right for my life and I needed to like be home and I needed to be around my family and my friends and you know have a bit of a personal life. Now you return for the series finale. I do. What was that like on set? I was in and out kind of quickly. It was shot in a way, because of my schedule, it was shot in a way where it seems like I'm there with everyone, but I'm actually only there with a handful of people. Okay. My stuff was sort of separated out. But it was nice. It was really nice to feel like I had closure with all of that. It was such a special character to have played and such a special show to have been a part of, and I felt like it was really important to have that closure. It feels really nice to be a part of something that had a message of hope and strength. And, you know, she's a woman who always tried her best, but made mistakes and then learned from those mistakes and would always try to be better. And there's something nice about putting that in the world, too. All right, up next. I told you Master Sergeant Fouts was reassigned. Yeah. yeah, this was me directing me. This is your baby. Yeah, this is my baby. Your directorial debut. How did you go about <laughs> directing yourself? It's weird, you know, I mean, I, I my hat's off to actors who figure out how to be the lead in a film and direct it because it's so much pressure. Um, okay. And and awesome. so much to think about and, oh. and consider while you're directing okay. to then also add turning that all off and then pretending to be another person. I kept feeling like who's going to call action and cut? Like it was so weird to be <laughs> in the like, scene and I'd be like action and then I'd like kind of get into the scene and do the scene with Michael and then Michael would sort of look at me like is it over and I'd be like uh, cut. I think it, yeah. Uh, anyone? Anyone? And it'd just be like silence and I'd be like. Well, I felt good about it. Let's move on. <laughs> That's so weird. <laughs> Can we expect more films from you? 
Yes. Yeah. That's great. Yeah, I, I feel really like love Hollywood it. Hollywood needs more female directors. I mean, I know yeah. it's such a trite thing to say, but we really do. I think we do. You know, it's. I think that. Um, it's just about trying to find that balance where we all become directors someday instead of having to worry about gender. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? I think the goal is to get to a place where it, it is naturally balanced. Because once you have that balance of female voices and diverse voices in the media, then you're going to start to have, see the cultural norms change. You're going to start to see more balance come out because those stories are all being told and they're all being consumed by um, by all of us. You know, And I think that, um, that that's really powerful. And so hopefully in the next several years, we'll start to see that shift happen. Thanks for directing yourself onto my couch, Jennifer. <laughs> Sundogs is on Netflix right now. See you next week on Couchsurfing.